Hey, uh, good morning, uh, Faith family. I just wanted to go ahead and uh, share my notes with those who, uh, again, are still, I know, uh, dealing with the coronavirus. It's no rhyme or reason. Um, we've got, uh, you know, I've got friends that obviously uh, haven't been infected by the virus. Some have no symptoms, some have mild symptoms, and then others end up in the hospital with it. So, uh, I just want to put my notes on here for those that are continuing, uh, those whose immune systems may be a little weak, and uh, they choose to stay home. And I encourage you to do that if you, uh, if your health is uh, is not in the best shape, stay home. I'll try my best to continue to put our notes each week on here for you, uh, share with you, so you can keep up what's going on uh, within your faith family. Uh, we're praying that this virus will be crushed, that it'll go away, but we continue. To pray and see what God uh, will do. As far as our faith family at East Marietta, uh, November the 1st is the day that we start back Sunday school. It's the day we start back Sunday night services. So, uh, man, keep praying for that. I'm praying this virus will be just absolutely gone by then uh, and crushed. We're just praying, seeing, seeking God's face in our full reopening. Right now we meet at 10 o'clock on Sunday mornings and 6.30 on Wednesday nights, all out in the uh, Life Center, it seems to be. Uh, God's blessed us with that, and it seems to be uh, working out uh, for the most part. So uh, today I want to come to you here in Acts chapter 8. Last week we were in Acts chapter uh, 7. We talked about Stephen. Why was Stephen stoned? Well, Stephen was stoned for simply two things. Number one, he told him you can't put God in a temple. It's the same today, trying to put God in a box. Uh, Stephen just said, hey, God doesn't live in a box. If your actions are different in the church house than they are outside, then you, my friend, are guilty of putting God in a box. If you say God only dwells in that church, that's why I don't walk in there and cuss everybody. That's why I don't walk in there with a horrible attitude. That's why I walk in there bitter at everybody. Then, friend, you're also guilty of putting God in a box. And so we looked at why they stoned Stephen for that. And then not only did they put God in a box, but um, Stephen said you can't worship with a waste in your heart. Uh, and he said, you uncircumcised of the heart there in Acts chapter 7. And so it really hit him to the core because the uncircumcised would have been the Gentile. And so they were taking the insult. He was comparing them uh, to a Gentile. And basically, Stephen was the, the foreskin, the waste, if you will, good for nothing. Uh, when you have that good for nothing stuff in your heart, unless you're spiritually circumcised, uh, friend, it's it's not any good. You're just walking around as a religious hyatt. And uh, doom is coming to you. Uh, it's not about religion. It's not about all the rules. It's about the relationship with Jesus Christ. So they took Stephen out. As they took him out, I shared with you last week that his eyes were fixed. He continued to look up. Not only was his eyes fixed, but his attitude was fixed. He knew um, that God would rescue rescue him from all his afflictions according uh, to the Old Testament. And then his... Uh, not only his eyes fixed, his attitude fixed, but his heart was fixed. He knew that uh, it was precious in the sight of God for the death of his saints. In other words, a welcoming home, a longing for Stephen, a longing for the saints. And so uh, we, we've went there, and now for the first time, now we've had some internal problems with Sapphire and Ananias. We had some internal problems as we opened that chapter 6, Acts chapter 7, uh, with bickering inside the church, and we've got all this took care of. Every time there's a problem, God has taken care of it. He's given the church wisdom, and the church is on fire. Man, things are going great. But when you get to Acts chapter 8, it's taking a turn for the worst. They've stoned Stephen for simply preaching the gospel. They didn't have a trial. Uh, they meant it was a mockery. It was a sham. They took him out. They stoned him. Uh, there was no defense. And then, boom, we get right into chapter 8. And if you notice in Acts chapter 8, and Saul was consenting in his death, and at the time there was a great uh, persecution against the church, at the time, in the Greek, means at the same time. In other words, while they're stoning Stephen, he's dragging people out by the head of the hair, headed down to the jail. Saul has caught fire here. He is trying to stomp out the gospel. He's taken his personal, making it a personal vendetta against any believer and every believer. You know, you think about the, the uh, church there in Rome. You think about those Christians in Rome that when they were marched into the great Colosseum and animals mauled them for entertainment for Roman, the Senate and all the uh, all, people from all over the world would come and just watch Christians be mauled to death and just die a horrible death. And they only had to do one thing. Say, I recant my belief in Jesus Christ. And they wouldn't be there. But friend, the gospel doesn't spread by cowards. It spreads by devoted Christians, men and women, 
warriors that are willing to carry the banner of Jesus Christ. And so we get here to Acts chapter 8. And uh, again, this is the first time the Bible says in verse 4 that Saul was wreaking havoc. Havoc is, is in the Greek a picture of a wild animal that's tearing apart its prey. It's simply saying, man, look, the the whole church, if you will, is being ripped apart piece by piece. It's painful, it's torture. The people are, man, they're leaving, they're running out of their homes, they're, they're fleeing other parts of the city, they're, uh, the, the, um, the synagogue, if you will, they're getting all their possessions, they're getting their homes, they're, they're losing everything, they're running out of town, and they're fleeing, if you will. That's what you get in Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. You find a church that's being crushed, it's just relentless, they're being torn apart, it feels like they're in a million little pieces. They don't know what to do. They're under great persecution. And then God's word begins to speak to us. And so right now, if you're feeling crushed, if you feel like you're being ripped apart, now God gives you the same instructions as he did here. He gives us the same uh, example as the church. If we're going to be a church of acts, if we're going to be a church that God has laid out and God has put a stamp of approval on, then we have to look and see what the church was doing then and understand are we doing that now. When the world comes on us, when we feel all this pressure from the world, when we feel like we're getting ripped into pieces, do we cower up and run or would he simply follow what God's word says to? Well, uh, friend, I, I don't know about you, but all I can do is preach the word of God. All I can do is share the word of God, but you have to take the tools and you have to use them. But let me share with you exactly what happened here. The Bible says in verse uh, eight, chapter 8, verse 1, and Saul consenting unto his death, and at a time there was great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. They all were scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. And here it is, except the apostles. Right out of the gate, when the churches, I'm talking about this is the same church in Jerusalem that Stephen just tried to give a defense and he was drug out, thrown off a cliff and people just absolutely, while he's on his knees trying to pray, there's rocks. He's being stoned from every angle. And right in the middle of that, in verse one, God says, but the apostles stayed. There's different commentaries on this, but I'm going to preach where Holy Spirit leads me, except the apostles. I believe with all my heart, these apostles, if you recall back to Gethsemane, where Jesus Christ is on trial, if you recall back to the garden there, where they come in and they arrest him, what happens to the apostles? They tuck tail and run. They leave him alone in the worst hour. Friend, all that is over. These men are bold now. Hey, we've absolutely betrayed Christ once. We've ran in the face of persecution, but we know he is the Messiah. They've been with him. They've seen the resurrection. They've seen the ascension. And now they come to a point of saying, if this ship may sink, but it'll only do so while our hands are on the ham. They stay at the church of Jerusalem. This is the only organized church. Its existence is in Jerusalem. The believers, although in prison and although scattered, these believers still needed the church to look to. If the apostles had fled the church, they wouldn't. The church would not be there. It would be destroyed. No, there no church to picture, no place to where to look for directions and guidance. The apostles were the backbone. They were the ones holding it together, the ones that everyone looked to for guidelines. No matter how scattered, these believers knew that the church was still existing through the courageous and boldness of their leaders. They saw boldness, they saw faith, and the apostles refused to walk away. Friend, let me tell you, I don't know where you're at, I don't know what you're going through, but let me beg you today, refuse to walk away. You want your children to see boldness? You want your children to see faith magnified? You want your co-workers to see your faith come alive? Then refuse to walk away during the period or during the walk of adversity. I'm telling you, people will only see you as a faithful man, as the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ shining through you when you dig down. I can see Peter pacing the floor as, as he's hearing the screams of these dear brothers and sisters as their families are separated, as they're just absolutely being mauled by the persecution of Saul. I can see him walking the floor and the words of Jesus goes over and over in his ears. This is the church. This is the church I will build. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. All the forces of hell. Jesus has never walked away from you. Friend, I beg you never to walk away from him. Every church has its problems because it's made up of imperfect people. But the church is the bride of Christ. You're committed to the bride. Do not walk away. My goodness, you think of our churches. I think of the little church I pastor at, East Marietta, and I, 
I think of uh, through the years when the numbers got low and it seemed so much discouragement that there were some men and women that dug down and they didn't walk away. And thus we're seeing the fruits of their faithfulness. I think of Fairview Baptist Church and my pastor. I'm sure that times during its history it got down to where it was absolutely nothing. But there were some faithful men and women that stood on the Word of God and they dug in and they didn't walk away. And now there's the fruits of that church. I think a little East Boonville Baptist Church over there in a the little corner on Church Street. And I can still picture you're driving by that church and what a little small church and I wonder at times when they had their problems and maybe persecution come man it was just so easy to walk away but there were some godly men and women who didn't walk away who stayed firm and look at the fruits that uh, that God has given that church and has given the communities and the outreach that community because the faithfulness of those from yonder years I pray church you are the generation you are the men and women that the folks of the next tomorrow will look back and thank God for your faithfulness. Do not walk away. Your family's dependent on it. The future is dependent on it. Do not walk away from the gospel of Jesus Christ in the face of adversity. My goodness, I think of Francis Scott Key there and uh, Francis Scott Key in the Battle of 1812 on one of the British ships watching it bomb Fort McHenry and bomb and bomb all through the night. He stood helplessless as an American on the British ship. He'd went there to negotiate the release of a prisoner of war, one of his friends. And in negotiation, he had to stay on the ship through the battle. And he's watching as that British ship is just absolutely trying to destroy Fort McHenry. They'd, uh, the British had already burned down Washington, and now this is the stronghold, Fort McHenry. And they're just pounding it and pounding it. But at morning's light, dawn started to break. He looked, and there was old glory. And we know the rest of the story. He pins the star single banner, as we know is our national anthem. You see, when he saw that flag, he had hope. The bombs, the battering, the destruction, but the flag was still there. And we know, obviously, uh, the British did not secede. Church, as the church is scattered, as the church is crushed, as the tax of the bonds begin to be released on the church, those believers look. Those believers here in Acts chapter 8, they looked and they could still see the banner flying high at Jerusalem. No matter the persecution, no matter the bombs, they had hope because the banner of Jesus Christ was raised high and it was still flying. Do not walk away. Carry your banner. Carry your cross. Friend, I beg you today, don't walk away from the church. If you're a believer and you have health, you need to be in God's house this morning. You need to be gathered with a, a faith family. Friend, do not walk away. Be part of those that are leaving a legacy for the next generation. Don't walk away. That's the, the example here God gives us. But not only that, keep ministering. If you notice uh, Luke, as he's writing, he says, Saul, he starts out with how, how much the church is being persecuted. But right in the middle of it, he said in verse 2, now we know in chapter 7, Stephen is stoned. Chapter uh, 8, verse 2, and devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. Why would God put that in there? Why what's the purpose? We're in persecution, persecution, and, and Luke just pins a sentence saying, hey, there's great men that come, devout men, and carry Stephen to his burial. Now, the burial there in the Greek simply means a funeral. In other words, he was given a funeral honor. You say, well, what's the big deal? Stephen was stoned. His friends and family wanted to give him his funeral. Well, here's the big deal. The big deal was anybody that was stoned, in other words, a male factor, was absolutely forbidden to have a funeral. Matter of fact, in the in the law, according to Jeremiah twenty two nineteen, they were to be buried with donkeys, the burial of a donkey, if you will. In other words, there was no honor, there was no prestige. You're a male factor, man. You've been crushed. They're allowed to bury you, but there were certain burial plots. But hey, it didn't matter what the old law had said because Jesus Christ had come, and now we're in the age of grace. And these men, even in the midst, hey, we're being crushed, we're being persecuted. But it is the right thing to do to keep ministering in the face of adversity. Keep ministering when you're crushed. Keep on keeping on being a servant of Jesus Christ. They took this man. It was a high honor. 
to have a funeral. It was a high honor to be buried with a father such as David was. And I'm telling you, friend, there's no other greater cause in life to honor the faithful men in God and to serve them and to lift them up and to edify them. These men kept ministering. It didn't matter. They kept on, kept on. The church don't stop ministering even though they feel crushed and feel like they've been torn apart. In March of this year, the church as we know it was turned upside down, obviously, when we had to close and we went through Easter. But yet, at the same time, when there were some men and women that got together and just drove by my house on a Sunday evening. Man, in midst of, uh, of COVID, in midst of lockdown, in midst of discouragement, all of a sudden I had these men and, and women and faith family that drove by my house honking the horn and waving and they ministered to me like, they, like I'd never been before. This little CD children and our church got together and one of our deacons put this together and says, Brother Ray, East Married of Baptist Church, quarantine music and sent to me and said, hey, during this time, you listen to this and I could hear the familiar voices that I couldn't be with, that I couldn't see, how it ministered to me, going to Montana and lifting up Brother Zach, just being in his house, spending time with him, sharing with him as he's out there, holding that banner in prior Montana. Uh, Brother, uh, Sonny and Tracy are in, in with Brother Brian in South Dakota this morning, holding that banner high, letting them know they're on the battlefront. We are here with them. Next week, we'll be traveling to Africa, me and another man. We're going to just sit Simply lift up our missionaries, Ben and Rachel Stanton, and hold them up, encourage them, tell them, hey, you are not forgotten. You are not forgotten. We will keep ministering in this COVID. We will keep ministering when the world is crushing the church. We'll keep ministering when all the ideologies of the world and politics seem to be against the church. We will continue to minister on. God can use the church to boost great movements and to lift up the lowest of the people if the church will simply keep ministering. I know you're scattered. I know it seems tough. I know it seems hard. But friend, can I beg you to keep ministering? Keep ministering. You may feel alone. Keep ministering. When God's people and God's work absolutely burns your heart, no matter the circumstance, no matter the path of your own, keep ministering. I read George Mueller is one of the examples I'll lay out with, uh, with my orphanage and the mission work overseas. But George Mueller at 77 after past, losing his first wife, he remarried at the age of 77 even though he was feeding thousands of orphans a day. And he had three huge orphans orphanages. George Mueller, his heart and desire was to go and preach the gospel. And at the age of 77, he struck out and he preached in all these countries and he preached the gospel. And amidst his ailments, amidst his mourning, he continued to minister. And then his second wife passed. And some 20 years later, and at the age of 93, George Mueller continued to write correspondence to everyone that donated money and continue to write correspondence. On Sunday morning, he preached the gospel there in his local church. On Wednesday night, I'm sorry, on Sunday night, he shared. On Monday morning, he shared a devotion there at the orphanage as he always did. And he continued to write correspondence. And for him that Tuesday night, he went home to be with the Heavenly Father. No matter his ailments, no matter the crushing, no matter how short the money was, no matter how many mouths he had to feed, George Mueller, up to the age of 93, continued ministering amidst any persecution that come around. I begin to think of Tim Tebow's daddy, Mr. Bob, sitting there in the Philippines with him. Uh, uh, Mr. Bob here now is in his uh, mid-60s, and now he's in his mid-70s, and just going up and watching that man with the zeal of, of the same strength that I had and was continuing on, going on no sleep, making sure the gospel continued on amidst his physical health, amidst his, uh, his age. He continued you know, ministering friend, I can't tell you when the world starts tearing you apart and when your physical body starts tearing you apart, you continue to minister. Don't you back up. Don't you walk away and don't you stop ministering. I began to think, uh, not only that, friend, I, I began to think of, of, of a great aunt of mine. Her name is Verda Mae Stubberfield, and I began to think of her. She nearly passed at child. Uh, she nearly died giving childbirth, and, and her baby went home to be with the Lord at a very young age, and she was left a cripple. Her husband died of a massive heart attack, a shut-in, if you will, but she continued to do stuff, and if you read her testimony she sent me, she been, began to uh, send Christmas cards out, and one year she didn't have enough money, but it was just Christmas cards or some 
some stockings and she desperately needed stockings, but yet she spent her money on Christmas cards and she said she couldn't do anything else, but she could lift those other shut-ins that had no family and she could do. And she said, I have no money and I, ha I don't have much and I'm a shut-in. I'm confined to this chair. I'm confined to this apartment, this apartment, but I will send help. I will do my part because as long as I'm ministering to other, the artesian well of joy will continue to bubble up in my soul. Friend, don't let life get you down. You keep ministering. You keep carrying the cross. You keep slinging the banner high of Jesus Christ when the mountains get steep and the climb seem hard. When you are struggling and you just can't seem to get ahead, don't stop ministering. Don't walk away and don't stop ministering. And last but not least, friend, I like verse 4. God's Word says, Therefore they were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the Word of God. Now, scattered is the same Greek word for sow and seed. Wow. Other words, God's Word was saying the seed is getting scattered and He's letting His Holy Spirit, which is always identified or symbolic of the wind, carry that seed to the uttermost parts, ends of the world. Let me remind you, don't walk away. Keep ministering. And finally, let God work through you right where you are at. It's not by mistake. You have a purpose right where you're at. It may, be a it may not be a pleasant time in your life. You may be in the darkest valley. Friend, I'm asking you, let God work right where you are at. The church has experienced pain up to this point, separation and sufferings. But God's word says that when they continue to preach the word, and that word uh, preach means evangelize by lifestyle, by speaking, by being vocal. The devil's trying to devastate and ruin you. He's trying to wipe you out. You're feeling the pressure. You're feeling crushed. Just preach, friend. The scattered were lay speakers. The lay believers scattered the word wherever they are, wherever their duty or circumstance placed them. They knew in Acts chapter 4 verse 20, God's word says, we cannot help but speak the things we've seen and heard. They couldn't do it. You begin to think of persecution. You think of Joseph who was sold by the Ishmaelites. Become a slave there. He's a, but yet God, in all his wisdom, God had used him to actually put him as a missionary in Egypt to save his own family. To which Joseph said, all things are against me, but were indeed for me. He couldn't see what God was doing, but the seed was being scattered. The little girl, you recall, that was taken by the Syrians. The little maid. And yet she was assigned there, uh, taken from her Jewish home. She was assigned to that Syrian she was signed to Naaman's wife. Could you imagine her parents? The heartache. Can you imagine what this little girl must have been like being kidnapped from her family to become a servant of Naaman, the great Syrian leader, and his wife? Yet right where she had been in the darkest days of her life, right where she's at, she continued to minister and said, Hey, I know how to cure your husband. That if he wants to be cured, it's through the man of God, Jehovah God. And obviously we know the story of the leprosy. A few years back, I couldn't understand our ministry in the Philippines due to some, uh, 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 I had audits and investigators that showed up on false claims there at our orphanage in the Philippines. And obviously I'm in America and uh, there was, uh, they were wanting to investigate things that uh, come to find out that were not true. But during the midst of that, and during all those audits, and man, just being here and the stress of it, and obviously I knew it was going to be timely. I knew it was going to be costly. I knew that uh, it would require me to uh, maybe make better policy and things like that. But uh, one of the requirements was we had to try to find some of our children's family because we actively try to find family of some of our children. But uh, the, this family supposedly lived in eastern Samar, which is a very rough area. It's uh, there's a lot of terrorist action there uh, with the uh, with the New People's Army. And so uh, it would require us to travel to Oris in eastern Samar. And I thought, man, I don't want to go here. Uh, but we, we, I sent money so that our staff could go there and try to find this family. And how God brings all this together, not only did he find the family in Oris, the family actually lives in a little community of Naduk Pond, about 15 minutes down a river. And so our staff, my director there, he traveled there, and he finally found the family we were looking for to get some pertinent information. But yet, in the midst of all the pressure, in the midst of God just using that, the midst of the devil trying to discourage and try to rip out the ministry that we have there in the Philippines, my director called and said, there's an unreached community, brother. I found 
they need the gospel. And the wheels become to put in motion. In October of 19, me and three other men, we traveled to Oris and then got on a boat and went to the duck pond. And I stood there and I preached the gospel of Jesus Christ to a crowd of about 200 in this unreached little village. And I watched one by one as they began to publicly profess their faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, I could still see the little girl that come up and uh, just hug me. I can see the little boy who couldn't speak, but yet God had provided a little Bible track. And he, even though he couldn't speak, he could read. And there he's reading the gospel that I just shared. I can see the elderly man and woman who looked like they hadn't eaten in months come and we were able to provide a meal. And then God worked miraculously through that and a church was planted and provided a pastor. And today there's the church in a duck pond in a community all because of persecution. Friend, I would have never went to a duck pond without the world trying to tear me apart. Thank God that right in your valleys you can still minister and you can continue to serve Him. Don't stop ministering. Don't walk away and don't stop preaching. You who are right where you're at for a reason. Continue on. Friend, I pray today that you'll be joined with your faith family. If you don't have one, we'd love to have you. We start at 10 o'clock here about another 45 minutes at East Marietta. You find a faith family. You dig in. I love you. I'm going to pray us out. Uh, for our faith family, we'll meet again 530 for a meal, 630 for a message on Wednesday night. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, thank you for today. Thank you, God, for just letting the acts come alive. And God, we see the real church, God. And we can't even comprehend, God, the persecution that this church is going through. And those believers, God, and their families and their homes as they've ripped apart, God, as they're killed, as they're jailed. But yet, right in the middle of it, you give us the example. You showed us boldness. Oh, Father, would you raise up bold servants today that would hold your banner high when the world is trying to tear us apart. Father, I love you. Thank you for today. Let today be all about you. We give you all the honor and glory. Forgive us some more we failed you. And I pray if there's someone there that don't know you, God, that may be watching that today, they give their life to you. Today, they'd surrender all. Today, Father, they'd just fall on their face. Ask for forgiveness and public confession, God, that they've surrendered their life to you. They've repented of all their sins, that they would follow through the believer's baptism. Oh, God, burn their hearts until they accept you. Father, I love you. Forgive us and more we failed you. In Jesus' name, and all of us said, amen and amen. Thank you, church. I hope you have a good day.